senior software engineer at Make 33. Um, guys who don't know what Make 33 is can talk to me later. <laughs> So anyway, uh, you can find my slides. His slides are online. You can do, go to jp.mp slash php scales. You can find the, the slides there. Yeah, I'll give it one more second, take a picture. Keep gone. Keep gone. Right, scaling. Um, basically, what do we talk about when we talk about scaling PHA, scaling an application? Mainly for the end user, from the end user perspective, it's about uh, the ability of your application to handle a number of HTTP requests at a reasonable amount of time. Basically, uh, having a responsive website. When I click a button, it goes to the next page. I click another button, something happens on the page, right? And the, pro the reason why it's slow is because something's happening behind the scenes that causes it to be slow. Either network latency um, or something else, right? Something happening on your server. One of the biggest uh, concerns people have with, with, with deploying a PHP application, or rather, one of the criticisms people, people have about PHP is that it doesn't scale. But look at Facebook, they have scaled, right? Um, look at Flickr. So these are the guys who have done some pretty cool stuff. So when we talk about scaling, it's about response time, being able to handle the number of current users, and also having to be able to handle the total amount of requests that, you, that, your server get, that comes to your website. God forbid that you have a website that's so popular and then it goes down, so yeah. Um, before I go into that, I'll introduce you about this concept called AppDex. Um, when we talk about you know how fast is my website, it's like there's no standard measurement that we know of. Um, this has been around since 2008, I think. Um, it's open standard called it's open standard for reporting and comparing performance of our software applications. It's called AppDex. You can Google it, you can wiki it. It's all up there. So basically, it's a formula. Basically, based on a uh, number of uh, requests they can sample, uh, you you set yourself a timing. It's like say, my target time is to get at least half a second of response time for each page, right? 0 0.5, that'll be the target time. Then you take a sample of, of requests. The number of requests that, that comes in based on the target time that you want, say half a second, will be considered as a satisfied count. Uh, tolerating count will be like a multiple of four. Like say half a second is your, your target time times four with two seconds, right? So total of counts or requests that was fulfilled within half a second, and those that were fulfilled within two seconds, you add them together, divide by two, and divide by total number of samples. So say, for example, you have um, the, the example just below, of 100 samples of, of requests coming to your site, 60 of them were fulfilled within the time, the time target, 30 were fulfilled at a multiple of four, and the rest was all basically dropped off, right? It was, it was not satisfied. So take that and you calculate the, the formula. So, yeah. So basically, the higher the number, so it comes up to z between zero to one. So if you get, the, get a one, means your website is very responsive, users should be happy based on your target time. So of course, you set a target time at five seconds, you know. Okay, so uh, this is an open, open formula. I've personally not actually used this much, but there are solutions out there which helps you, helps you do this. There's a software out there called New Relic. Which, uh, which is a server monitoring tool that gives you pretty good stat statistics about this. So check, check them out, they're a pretty good tool. All right, so we talk about scaling PHP. I mean, we, what should we focus on, right? So first of all, because we're talking about PHP, we got, we, then we have to focus about PHP. Kind of weird saying that myself. Focus on PHP itself, what can you do in PHP to make it scale better? Next question would be, what, what, what PHP doesn't have, does, it's not installed on its own, right? It have, it, it's installed on a web server, on, on, top of, uh, on top of Apache. Yes, it's, a, you know, it's on a physical Linux machine most of the time, and all these other things around it. So we we'll focus on two things, and then of course, to be our application design. How do you design your applications to make it scale? Focus on the PHP. First of all, profile your code. We are building our, our website. Um, learn to install I think, uh, some profilers into your system. For example, um, where is it slow? So with, with a profiler like Xdebug, you help you find out which part of your code is slow, why it's taking so, so much time to load. Um, and basically, you can, you, you can, yeah, there's a lot of tools out there. Xdebug is basically, basically I think, the, the industrial standard for profiling of code. There's an open, open source project called XHProf, developed by Facebook. And of course, you use, use, new, use new Relic. Uh, let me show you a little, little sample here. So I have 
A simple website on Laravel is loaded. So what I do is, if I'm running a profiling test, so basically what I can do is add this little thing in the back, it runs it, and it creates a file. In basically, it, it profiles the, the, the call stack from the very, from very end point, at the point where it starts the file, uh, to, 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 yeah, so basically that's it. Let me see if I can get the latest one. So that particular call I just got, I have the web, this is a website, or rather this web, uh, this, this open source project, you can just drop into your web, your PHP application called WebGrind, which can give you a statistics like this, which is kind of handy for finding out how, what is my code doing, how many times that particular command was invoked, how much time is spent on that, on that particular part. You can see this in percentage or you can see this in microseconds. Which can be a bit help, can, can be quite helpful. So you can find out which part. This is a Laravel uh, sample app, for example. So I've loaded the page and it tells you what which part of the code has gone through. So basically, it tells me which other areas which is spending the most time on. In this case, it's spending a lot of time loading, going through the composer auto load uh, class loader, uh, which is pretty okay. You can also hide PHP application, so you know that. Um, what, you're, what you're measuring are basically code that you have developed or, or codes that are part of the framework, right? So when I've done that, it will take away all the other stuff which, was not, which are in the PHP frame, uh, in PHP itself. Like, so if it's turned on, you will see um, stuff like, say, um, file get contents is called, is file is called, is directory is called. These are all PHP native commands. We don't really need to see how fast or you might be, you might be interested if you if you're calling that command uh, many times, like say reading a file, checking a file where the file exists and stuff like that, or writing to a file, right? Those things may take out a lot of time, right? So with this, you can basically see with a glance like this particular call going to your server, how much time is it using in within your call stack, and from there you can find out how what are the things that might be problematic, right? Um, yeah, so this can be turned on for all requests or, can, or only when you have uh, the header or rather when passing the a, a, when you're passing something like this X debug profile. So you only start the profiling when you tell it to. Um, so that's profiling your code. Another thing you can do to make your PHP run faster is to install op cache, some form of, some form of op cache, op code caching, right? So PHP is you know it's an interpreted language. But when PHP is requested, it's read by the PHP interpreter and compiled into a machine language called opcode. So op the opcode can be actually cached so that it will not have to incur uh, uh, time to reinterpret the, the PHP file, right? So when it's in memory, it's going really fast. Or rather, when it's memory, it's, only, it's already in memory, it doesn't take up any more uh, processing, processing time in terms of interpreting the code and converting it into, into the machine language. Um, as of PHP 5.3 uh, onwards, it was APC, which is kind of like built into PHP. Uh, as of 5.5, I think they've uh, now switched to opcache. Opcache, which is uh, the previous name of opcache was Zen, and Zen Optimizer. So they have rebranded it as opcache. So the, from, from PHP 5.5 onwards, that is like a de facto uh, thing. So these are things to consider. There are also other, other types of accelerators. We call them, this group of software, we call them accelerators, which basically make your PHP run a bit faster. So there's a wiki out there with a whole bunch of this. Personally, we, in, my, in my company, in Make we use X, Xcache. Uh, Xcache is interesting because we can also put, it, it also acts as a key value store. And you also, uh, there's a utility, you can see that which other files that have already been, has been um, uh, cache in, in, in the index in cache itself. So there's a, there's a web utility you can check out. So like which other files has already been interpreted, compiled, and stored into, into, the, into the caching system. Right? So, so with that utility, utility you can go in and say, okay, these are the files that are already there, I can remove them if, or if I need it to be reinterpreted. It's pretty cool. So Xcache also acts as a key value, key value store, which can be quite handy if you want to have uh, data to be safe for a short period of time. You might also want to consider alternative uh, PHP runtimes. So if you're looking at, uh, if you're already running PHP uh, on your Apache, I think you're, you're on Apache using mod PHP, I think that's pretty straightforward. It's easier to set up. 
There are alternatives out there. Um, like for example, fast CGI and, and PHP FPM, which, are, which is another which a, another alternative uh, fast CGI implementation for just for PHP. So all this is in, ter in terms of complexity of, of installation, right? Is mod PHP, fast CGI, and FPM, um, and the other and the good thing about uh, fast CGI and PHP FPM is they can run on any other web server. So you can run on Apache, you can run on Nginx, um, like HTTP and a few others. It's pretty cool. Um, but the problem is it's not that easy to set up. Uh, it can be a little bit complex to get it running. Um, but if you've got that done, it's pretty cool. Um, the, that, okay, the thing is, PHP, the speed of running, of just interpreting PHP, that, that it doesn't differ much between all these three. It doesn't differ much between mod PHP, fast CGI, and, and the FPM. It, there's not much difference in how fast they interpret and they run the PHP code. But the problem is when it's dropped into the web server, how it's used by a web server, there is, a, it, it has a diff there, there is an impact. Uh, for example, what mod PHP is uh, when Apache uh, spawns a new uh, process, usually PHP is also uh, started up together with the process. So basically, if you, you right, try to use P, uh, Apache to load um, static contents, it could be very heavy because it loads up the full PHP binary into the memory, which is kind of crazy. So try not to use, uh, try not to use PH, uh, Apache with mod PHP for static contents. So that's one. Okay, of course you can also go for the, the way that Facebook did it, which is to compile your PHP code into C++ code and you know, load it as a web server. Um, they open source a framework and the system is called Hip Hop. I think the new version is called Hip Hop VM, which basically creates a virtual machine that runs PHP. It's kind of hardcore. <laughs> we don't need that. <laughs> okay, so... Um, and also, if you're, writing, if you're writing on PHP application, try to use as much as you can native PHP functions. Uh, there are some times where you download third-party libraries, so there's a website called PHP Classes where you find all, all sorts of different handy implementations and whatnot of array manipulation, graphic generation, and all that stuff. But look at PHP code first. Look at what is already implemented in the PHP uh, core, you know, the core extensions as well. Because if chance chance is already implemented, it's probably been stress test. It's probably most performance. So you try to use those as much as you can. Unless, for example, you're using a PHP version which doesn't support it, like say you're using PHP 5.1 or 5.2, which is pretty old. My company still uses 5.2. I'm kind of sad about that. <laughs> but still, you know, um, yeah. So you, unless you're using an older version of PHP, but and you really need that functionality and there's something available out there, then try to use that. Otherwise, if it's already implemented in the core, PHP stack, use that. Um, it helps a lot. So that's all pretty much about PHP, optimizing PHP. Everything else around PHP? Well, the server itself, there's one thing you can optimize. Um, you, if your, a lot of your PHP processors, processors are memory bound, you, you probably just need to add more RAM, right? Like you, you, you're running a small instance on AWS, it's not able to support the load upgrade to a medium instance, right? So that's one way. You can use a, a smaller command called VM stack, which gives you uh, some information about, uh, the, about what's happening. So for example here, if I'm in VM stat, So what this do? It does tells me the status of the memory. So if you see a lot of swapping in and out, S I and S O. Is it too small? <laughs> okay, never mind. Let's bring this up a little bit. Right. So if you see a lot of swapping in and out, it means it's uh, it's it's writing to to the swap memory. Um, if that's the case, it usually means there's not enough RAM in your system, and that's where you need to add more RAM. If it's a physical server, you can just add more RAM, go ahead and do it. If not. Um, then you probably have to think about upgrading or changing your, your service provider. Um, use faster disk. Uh, uh, if, if your PHP application is I/O bound, that's it's a lot. Of, it's writing a lot of files into into the file system. It's writing like say reports or CSV files or whatnot, and those things are taking up a lot of your time. You might want to consider investing in a a, a faster hard drive. Right, say for example, DigitalOcean, uh, they claim that all their, all their uh, virtual machines, 
are running on SSDs, which is can which can improve vastly improve the I/O, this uh, the writing, this time in which it writes files into the, into the system, right? So if you're, so you know by looking at the web grind uh, statistics, if you see a lot of things like file write file put contents and it's taking a lot of time, um, that usually means it's a lot of writing involved, right? So that's one thing you can look at. Um, if if, it's, if you find that whenever there's a, a lot of heat on your website, your CPU goes up, um, there's a lot of things going on, um, this might also be CPU bound, so get a faster CPU. You know. <laughs> yeah, there's another thing that could happen which is just a network. It's just because your, your, your service provider is, is just giving, putting you on a shared host. Usually the problem, main problem with PHP applications is that sitting on a shared machine, uh, one machine with 60 or 70, Different webs, web hosts, uh, web uh, applications running at the same time. That's going to co cause problems for you right? when you suddenly have a spike in traffic. So getting your own machine or getting your own uh, virtual uh, instance on AWS or DigitalOcean or any other guys is very good. Uh, in the sense, you are you isolated to just your your processes isolated and probably will be better for you. A VPS would be encouraged if you uh, if you can't afford a full dedicated machine. Um, data store. So you might want to think about where, how your data is, is stored, right? That's, so, so, so first it's about the, the physical hardware in which your, your PHP application runs on. The second thing, next thing you look at is how your data is stored, right? Um, so for example, your, so your database. Um, I've had, in the past, I wrote a, 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 an application on Cake PHP. And basically, I, I started doing it thinking, ah, yeah, it's good. I'm going to be done in a month, right? I don't need to worry about database schema and all that shit. Right? So I went in and did the whole thing, and then there was a kick PHP application with a lot of joins and all that. And it was slow. Even on my local machine, it was like clicking, on button, clicking a link. It would take two seconds to just load the page. I was like, what the hell is going on, right? So I went back in and looked at the tables. Oh, okay, I didn't index the foreign keys. Okay, let's just, let's just try this. So I indexed the foreign keys, I indexed a few other columns, and boom, it was much faster, right? So, um, yeah. <laughs> so one thing you can do to try and discover where, you, where, where your application is, or your database is doing a full table scan, uh, is to turn on something called a slow query log. You can you just Google it online, you find, you find some really interesting, uh, you'll find some sample code, but you can just drop into your uh, my.cnf, which is your MySQL config, config file, you generate a new log file which will show you when a uh, SQL query is taking too long. You can set a threshold as well. I say, like for example, if SQL query runs one in five seconds, that's a candidate for, for a slow query. So you can actually tr track all those and find and go back and check them. Right. Um, in my company, we actually use a, uh, a we use cacti and nagios. Uh, basically, a cacti is a chart that kind of, that kind of tracks the size of the growth of uh, like it tracks it tracks everything is happening on your machine. So it tracks in our case in that particular case it was tracking the size of the slow query log. So the speed in which it grows. So you, when you see it growing growing quite a fa fair bit, we know that there's a lot of slow query logs generated, which means there are some print something wrong in your database. Uh, as in some some queries are creating a lot of load on your machine. So that's one thing you can look at because if it's creating load your response time will suffer and users won't get the page that they want, right? So it, uh, nicking these things in the butt very quickly is, is, a very, is very helpful for you creating responsive web applications. You might also want to consider using other, other forms of data store, things that are faster to read and write. So for example, for MySQL, we, we use it as our authoritative store in, in make the tree. So that's where we put all our data in. But there, we also use memcache and we use Redis for different types of data that we need to read and write very quickly. In our company, we recently uh, introduced a chat sync, basically a, a, a chat synchronization uh, thingy. So as in, if a guy is offline, you will, he will, uh, it comes back, all the messages that you receive when it's offline will then be downloaded back to, to him. Uh, to make it read and write very fast, it causes that data which will expire, say, after two weeks. Right? So in a lot of these data stores like Memcache or Redis or Couchbase, Maybe not couch base, but Redis, for example, you can specify a, a time, as in how long this state, this key or value should 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 live in in this in the memory. After like two weeks, you expire, you'll be gone forever. You don't have to worry about cleaning up data, right? So and it's really fast to read and write. So the things like MongoDB, Memcache, Redis, 
consider all this, measure their performance, and vis-a-vis -vis what you have right now, and then you consider them. Um, as a general rule of thumb, I think Memcache is great because it's, you can read it. Uh, for example, if, you're, if it's a clustered machine, you have like five, for your company, we have about 16 web servers, and they don't really have any shared um, state, whereas in there's no, um, we don't have any PHP sessions in our, in our, in our applications. So we, if you're using a clustered uh, uh, solution, like having many servers and all using PHP, you can use um, session, uh, session logging using uh, Memcache. It's, all, it's already built into PHP itself. So you can go in and tweak the, your, your session caching for PHP to use Memcache. And the thing about Memcache, it can also be clustered. So you can have like a, a, a cluster of five servers all taking up the load of all your different Memcache keys. Pretty cool. Um, again, measure the performance vis-a-vis -vis what you have right now before you jump right into it. Um, web servers. Um, PHP 4 performs really well on, P on Apache because it's part of the, of the, uh, of the Apache memory uh, process. It gets load, but it gets loaded every time we serve a uh, PHP application. So when it tries to use P uh, Apache to, to serve static content, it gets a bit heavy. Right? So, you might, so uh, as recommended by even Yahoo, they will use a separate web server for the static content, put it on a cloud, put it in the, sorry, on a cloud, put it in a CDN. Right, uh, content delivery network, which helps you serve the files better, faster. Um, you and also you can try distributing a load by having a, 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 a load balancer in front of like, all your web servers. There's another way you can consider making your application run faster. You can also consider a caching service like a Varnish or Hard Proxy. Only when all these other options have kind of like wore itself out. Only then you should try to consider some other web servers like Nginx or something else, okay? Um, again, measure, measure the difference, measure the difference setup. How fast, how well can they perform and how well can they serve your, webs, your web applications? Um, another thing which we, we, uh, we try to do is a concept of share nothing. Basically, each server performs only one role. So basically, one machine is a web server. Don't load a MySQL server into it or something else, right? So one server performing one role. Only when you can afford it, of course. But, but by the time you have a load problem, chances are you probably is, is a good problem you're having and chances are you get, you've got funding to scale horizontally. So, yeah. Um, so what this does is it optimizes CPU, memory, disk, I.O. and the allocation for just one box. So one box, that's one thing. Um, yeah. But then if we do it this way, like what we did in my previous company and found was uh, we decided that, look, uh, MySQL running on the same server as our Apache machine wasn't a good idea. So we decided to move it out and throw it into RDS. Basically, we were on AWS, right? So we moved the database out from our, phys our physical AWS machine and hosted it on AWS. On, sorry, on, on, on AWS RDS. But it wasn't an improvement, as in it wasn't much faster. Because when, you did, when we did that, it, it creates another problem of network latency. Because you have a physical machine here and your RDS in, in a custom server, maybe another, but probably in our setup it was a bit wrong. We were probably in the a, in a, in a wrong availability zone, which was kind of screwed up. So anyway, it was, it would, yeah. So be careful when you're doing this. Because when you move things away or pluck, pluck your machine, your services away from the, the core machine, you create another problem of network latency. So making sure that you have you on a data on a host on a on a, on a host provider which can helps you with all these things, that'll be good. Uh, on AWS, for example, there is a way in which you spin up a cluster of machines and have them all on the same availability zone uh, and on the same uh, stack of servers. So basically, they are physically closer to each other. There's a way to do that in AWS. So that's something we're going to consider. Um, right, so we've talked about what to do in PHP, what to do outside of PHP, and what the next thing to do is how do you improve your application design. Um, someone once told me scalable code is usually quite ugly because it's definitely not readable. There are a lot of things, there are a lot of hacks you put in and there are a lot of things that you do and that makes it scale better. It works. But it's not pretty, right? You look at it. What the hell is this? But it works, right? So, um, so try not to try not to optimize too early. Um, just build up your application first. Get users. 
once you get users, then you got a good problem. How do you improve the scalability? Which means go back and refactor stuff, remove redundancies, and do all this other stuff that I talked to you about. So anyway, um, one thing you can think about doing is create uh, your application is trying to plan it with um, non-blocking processes. So things that, for example, um, uh, one, one, one thing I like to really do is um, file uploads. We upload a, 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 a profile photo, right? Traditionally, what, how we do it is we, the photo goes up to the server, we, our PHP file takes it, save, uh, takes it from the temporary folder, resizes it, compresses it, save it to destination file, then tell the server, tell, tell the user, oh, your file is down here. Right. So the pro whole process of compressing the photo and all that takes a lot, lot of time, which is why some, some, uh, uh, some companies, actually, or rather some websites, tells you you can upload a 500k KB file or 200 KB file and stuff like that. So to, that's basically in one call stack. You are, you're doing everything in one call stack, which can be quite heavy. So uh, one way of doing it as asynchronously is to, once the file is received, you put, it, put the file name into a queue, and that and you have a worker queue that would uh, they have a separate queue uh, that would uh, take the file and, and process it, resize it, and all that outside of the call stack. So you don't have to worry about whether the file is finished or not. And just you just basically once you get a file, throw an item into the queue and then respond to the user. Your file is, is uploaded. We're processing it right now, right? Like for example, speaker deck. Guys, having, uh, you guys use speaker deck. So when you upload a file to your slides of speaker deck. You tell it the file is fully uploaded, but it's still processing. So basically, it's right processing in the queue. Well, but that gives a very positive user experience in the sense that I can immediately see that oh, my my file is I, I can immediately see if get user feedback that my file is now uh, uploaded. I don't have to see immediately. If I can, it's good. If I can't, it's, it's okay. So basically, having designing our application in a way that it can create, it can do things asynchronously. That's pretty awesome. Um, yeah. So uh, also another thing you can try to do is most content management systems and applications uh, frameworks have some form of file caching, right? So like say in, in WordPress on Drupal, there's a tick, there's a tick somewhere that says turn on caching, <laughs> which will basically pre-render your 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 files, which is which improves the performance and speed because most of the time for content management systems, you take time to render images and all that stuff. Magento also has that problem as well. So turn on the, the ca internal caching if, as you, if, you, if you can. Um, some application frameworks like KPHP and Laravel has their own uh, caching as well. So that for views that don't get updated very often, it will basically cache the image or cache the, the, the rendered HTML uh, content. Right? Um, another thing you can try to do is create abstraction layers. Basically, Right, you, you're not sure how your database might be designed, right? You might have a, a, a cluster of servers that you want to set up, or, you, or like you have readings, uh, MySQL, you have a servers that you read, that you have a, you have a cluster which is your reading, you, a cluster where you read from, and a cluster you write, for, you write to, uh, or you have some other ways of doing your, your, your system. Um, instead of creating a, a library that just talks directly to MySQL, create another layer which is like a model layer, just a data access layer. You write, so whenever you change your clustering uh, mechanism or you, you change entirely out from MySQL to say Postgres or something, you don't have to worry about um, refactoring your code too much. So all you do is refactor data, data access objects. Right, that's one thing you look at. Um, with PHP, with, Kik, with PHP, there's a, there's a concept of OB or op, output uh, buffering. So flush your buffer as soon as you're ready. Right, say for example, once you hit the hit, call the command OB OB flush, which will basically output whatever has been rendered so far. It will help get content down to the browser as soon as it, as soon as possible. So that's another thing you can consider to make your application run a little bit faster. That's of course provided you're actually doing something on your own application framework, general purpose framework like KPHP or Laravel. If you're using uh, a, a CMS like WordPress or Drupal, I'm not sure you can do that, but you can tweak it if you want to, right? So, um, so the word about content management system and general purpose frameworks like KPHP and Laravel and Codeigniter and everything else out there. Um, CMSs are easier to install and configure, but limited by what, what it can provide. And uh, general purpose frameworks are a bit more hackable. You can do stuff your way. Um, 
don't pre-optimize. So a conclusion, don't pre-optimize, build your application first, right? <coughs> of course, do the normal amount of refactoring that you need, but don't worry about the load. Because when, when that problem comes, it's a good problem, right? Um, so I measure your current performance before you think about moving to the next improvement, right? Because, because you have no yardstick to measure the improvement by this is quite pointless, okay? So that's all, thank you. Uh, on the slides, there are some um, resources you can look at, um, like Yahoo has a, a documentation on how they have set 25 rules so you can look at how to improve uh, speeds. Uh, this blog I, I read once in a while, high, high scalability, Cobra has an interesting topic about, about server architecture you can look at. You can check out my open source project called PHPQ, which helps you create an a asynchronous kind of system. And um, I've put up a little, little project online. Um, I intend to show a bit more demos, but I don't think I have time. So yeah, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mike Chang. <laughs> questions, questions. He has a decade of knowledge to offer you guys. Hey. Simon. Uh, statement first, uh, one cool feature of PHP FPN, you can actually get a slow log of, of your application requests. So I, I use it in production and it, it, I can sort of narrow down which of my requests are quite slow. But a question Sweet. about your profiling. So were you profiling with Xdebug and then using WebGrind to uh, crunch the stats? Mm -hmm. is, that, is that how that works? Yes, that's right. A X debug when you turn on the, turn on debugging, it will basically output a file. Um, let me try and find the file here. Is that, is that a standard parameter like question mark default profile? I think so. Okay. Let me look at my my ads, my config is actually quite vanilla. Yeah, it's it's just that turn on profile and profile enable trigger. So that's, that's what's it turn on. And that, and that outputs like a HTML file or CSV or something? It will output a, let's have a look at it. It outputs a, a profile like this, cache grind out dot something. So it looks a whole bunch of stuff. So web grind basically crunches this number. Uh, you can also, there's also another software you can look at, it's called kcache grind, uh, which is a desktop which is a desktop software you can look at. This runs most, I think, on Linux. I think there's also a WinCache grind for on Windows. Uh, on Mac, I think there is a version of this that runs on Mac as well. So which this basically gives you a, a nice little table or graphic of the core stack, which are the parts that are taking much, most of the time. So very helpful. <coughs> about uh, one more question. No one? Right, so uh, thanks. Oh, yes, one. Yeah. <laughs> what? Okay. okay, fine. Can I take a picture of this? Yes, you can. <laughs> but I believe uh, Michael also shared it out. Uh, yeah, um, the slides are already online, I think, to, yeah. Have any questions? Just drop me an email. Uh, my email is listed in my website, kodakungfu.com. Yeah.